Music is creation. In reggae, the lyrics, the music itself, the arrangements, that vibe, such melody, everything within music moves people. So wrote the trailblazing bla reggae pioneer Burning Spear. And we hope you'll be more than moved by Taj Weeks and his band Adoa on this elevating episode of B-Side. Are you ready? I'm San Gauja, your host for this oral odyssey, and I'm asking you to keep it locked. Grab your items, your roots, drinks. We're right here on B-Side. Let's go!
Taz, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Right. I'm doing great. Welcome to B-Side. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, let's start with this song. Um, uh, seek the secret spaces in my thoughts and learn what I've been taught. What, what, uh, what, what's the name of this song? Angry Language. Angry Language. Angry Language. And what is it about? It's about me. It's about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's about, you know, my mother told me when I was growing up that I was a spiritual being on a human, a human journey, not a human being on a physical journey. Was she referring to you or in general? She was talking to me personally. That you are a spiritual being on a human journey. On a human journey. And that whenever I was about to stray, I should tap myself and seek the spaces in my thought, because I was a spiritual being. And you know all the vibes that were coming that were not right. I had to be like, she would say sometimes, you had to be like a fish. Because even if the fish swims in, in salt water, when you take it out, you still have to salt it, it's unsalted. Mm. She wanted me to be in it, but not of it. Mm. And that's basically what the song is. So whenever I get sidetracked, I have to go back to me. Mm. And I have to seek the spaces in my thought to unlearn all the old vibes they've been teaching me. Mm. And that's basically what the song is. Interesting. Yeah. Why, why do you call it angry language? Well, I'm learning an angry language because, you know, if I drive down the street and I get an angry person walking down there, an angry drive, everybody's angry. Mm. If I tap into that energy, then I become angry too. Mm. You see? Ah. So if I tap back into me, then I just realize that these are distractions. But mm. still, I have to be centered and be me. Mm. So yeah, man. Well, you know what the thing is, you have to name it something. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. The angry language is more of a provoking thing than seek the spaces in my thought, you know? Yes. So yeah. Yeah, it is That's provocative. That's what it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Wow, there's so much ground to cover. How long have you been playing music? Uh, I don't know. Mm. I mean, is it something like, did you... Did you start when you were young, like just tinkering around? Or, you know, well, or I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. When we were little children, what we used to do for entertainment in my house, it was line up in the living room and sing to my parents. Mm. And then my father would get up at the end of the night and he would sing to us. And it's only in retrospect I realized he was actually teaching us how to breathe. Huh. You know, when I was um, about nine years old, my brothers and I had a band together. Mm. We used to sing the old Jackson 5, Sly and the Family Stone thing, you know? Um, the unfair thing about it, I was the last, but I wasn't the lead singer, so I rebelled. Mm -hmm. Because I said to them, you know, in the Jackson 5, Michael was the youngest and he used to sing, and how come I can't sing? Uh -huh. <laughs> so my brother gave me a little slap behind my head and said, go sit down in the corner uh -huh. and stop this. But yeah, we, we did this for a while. <laughs> and when the Rastafarian movement came in, you know, we kind of gravitated to it. Mm. But also, when I was 13, I had my own radio program on a radio station in St. Lucia. Mm. And I would get there early, and I would flip through the old albums, and from Van Morrison to the Beatles to Hendrix to, you know, uh, Mighty Sparrow. And I, I realized that I really paid attention to the lyrics. Mm. So when the band started with my brothers and I, my job was to write down the lyrics. Mm. Uh, and you don't even realize that you're being prepped for something, but only when you look back, you realize that that's why I place so much emphasis on the lyrics. Because mm. the lyrics always matter to me. Wow. Yeah. Um, we'll get in, I have some more questions for you in terms of your background, we'll get into a bit later. Uh, but the name Adowa, that's the name of your band. Yeah. And what does that mean exactly? It's the Battle of Adowa, man. Every rest of man know about the Battle mm -hmm. of Adowa. Yeah, but can you explain? This is 19th century. Yeah, 1896. Uh, yeah. The Battle of Adowa. Mussolini and their brothers tried to come take over Ethiopia and, you know, we beat them back with sticks and stones and the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. So it's a victorious battle, mm. you know, and it's a battle that every rest of man should remember. Mm. The Battle of Adowa. So my great grandparents are Ethiopian. Mm. So it's in respect to them and to victory here too. So yeah, Adowa. Mm. All right, well, let's get into another tune. Uh, yeah, we, we have a, a lot to talk about, and um, yeah, this is already an intriguing journey. Yeah, we'll play a tune called uh, Bullet for a Gun. Bullet? Bullet for a Gun. Bullet for a Gun.
Yes, Taj. <laughs> like a bullet for a gun. Yes. The lyrics seem uh, pretty straightforward, but um, what, what are you singing about? 
Well, we see so many people dying from this. Mm. You know, um, I think usually when the man is pulling the trigger, if you realize what was the recurring, or the, the, the um, vibrating the repercussion. repercussions, mm. he wouldn't pull that gun, he wouldn't pull that bullet. Mm. You know, because the song says a million birthdays will be missed mm. for a bullet from a gun. A million smiles and cherished kisses from a daughter or a son. You know? I think we get gung on, we get woke up and we get angry and we do things and in our quiet time we kinda regret what it is that we did. Mm. I just want everybody to think about it before they pull that gun. Mm. You know, so I mean it's been said a million times before, we're trying to say it in a different way for a new generation. Mm. To realize that we can solve our problems without guns and ammunition. Mm. Fist, I mean, we, we can solve this, you know, we can talk it out. Mm. So that's basically what we're doing, trying to let people think about it. Because, you know, my father used to say, don't worry about the action, worry about the reaction. Mm. So we're asking people to worry about their reactions. Mm. You know, you can walk and live to live, and, you know, live to fight another day. You don't have to settle everything. There's, there's, a, there's another tune that we'll play um, in a while that says, all our conflicts we settle with a war. Mm. We don't have to. Mm. And we can teach our children otherwise. Mm. But yeah, bullet for a gun, everybody knows this. They know if you shoot somebody, they die permanently, that's it. You know, I kind of a little off track a bit, but I am from St. Lucia. Mm. And what we're trying to do with the media is to have them focus more on the victims mm. than to give the shooter the five minutes worth of fame that he's looking for. Mm. So if I kill somebody, let's focus on that person's family and what we've done to the family, mm. how we've affected the family, how the breadwinner is not there, or the mother who caresses the child is no longer there, or the son who the parents look forward to coming home is gone. Mm. I think if we start showing that side of it, people are going to twist it a little bit, you know, start being a little different. Because every time I watch the news, the first thing they tell me, any news you watch anywhere, the killers is, is the first thing, is the headlines. Mm. Somebody died in the Bronx today. Somebody died in Brooklyn today. Mm. But you want to say that somebody's suffering because somebody else killed their son in Brooklyn today. Mm. Just switch the script a little bit, you know? But yeah, that's sidetracked. But Bullet for a Gun is a song we just played. Well, you know what? Um, how, how does your upbringing in St. Lucia, I don't know when you left there, but how does how do those early years that you spent in St. Lucia, um, how do you think they affect the way that you see your life here in New York? Um, I grew up in 83 in Sunshine, unlimited freedom, uh, complete and absolute love from my parents. I'm the last of 10, mm. you know, and um, I, show, I saw sharing and caring. Mm. And I, I think the greatest way to learn something is not to realize that you're learning it. Mm. You know, just watch it and you try to be that. I think we are, in essence, in the growing up years of our lives, a part of everybody we've met, good or bad along the way. And I think my parents shielded me enough to have met enough good that I try to live that life. Mm. Yeah. I think that's probably how it affected me the most. Mm. All right. Let me play you another song. Yeah, let's do another one. i play a song called Since Cain. Since Cain slew Abel, there's been misery and pain. Come and 
Ash. Yes, sir. Um, how do your songs come to you? It, I'm going to ask you a two-part question here. How your songs come to you, um, as in what is your process of writing, but also how do you build a song? Well, uh, the answer to both of them parts is the same thing. I don't know. Mm. You know, um, I, I think them songs are already written. Mm. I think it's a level of consciousness you bring to the process. Mm. You know, because it's, you know, I mean, these words are there before I came. Mm. I'm not reinventing the wheel. You know, they're there. I think if you tap again within, I think the songs are floating in the air, man. It's just, you just pick them up. Mm. Because for me, most of my songs come at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm sleeping. Mm. And I wake up and I'm scrambling for a piece of paper or some kind of recording device mm. to put it down. You know, I believe in inspiration. I think it's an internal thing. But I also believe in outspiration, which is an external thing. Mm. So I think collectively, both of them come together to make a song. Mm. You know, I, however, in saying all of this, I am not the kind of songwriter who needs to be on a mountain top to write a song. Mm. Songs come at any time for whatever reason, whether good or bad. So I don't know if there's a process. Because mm. if there's a process, if I knew the process, I would tap into it so I could write better songs and faster songs. Mm. But it happens when it happens. I'm there to receive it. I put it down on paper and there's a song. Mm. So, yeah. How long has... Now we have six people on stage, seven mm. people. How, how, long have, how, how long has uh, Adoa been this uh, configuration? My brothers and sisters. Yes. Well, we quarrel sometimes, but we're brothers and sisters still, you know? But Rads and I, based man, have been together for the longest. Mm. Way back when, before we were gray and before we had children. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we, you know, I don't know, I came and John came and Val came and Baldwin came and Jeff is my baby brother right now. So yeah, you know, it just, we don't pay too much attention to time, you know, it's just, mm. everybody's there for a reason, they came at the right time, and they're here. Yeah. And how many albums do you have right now? We have four, the fifth one comes out next month. What's, what's the name of it? Love, Urban, Reggae. Love, urban, reggae. Yeah, we're changing the mantra of sex, drugs, and rock and roll to love, urban, reggae. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah, because love, urban, reggae, with, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, I find a little destructive. Mm. So no more sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right now, everybody, the new mantra is love, urban, reggae. Love, urban, All right? reggae. Yeah. 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 And obviously, um, you are a Rasta man. Yeah, I stand Rasta. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, in terms of uh, the content of uh, what you write about, would you say that there is kind of a, um, a philosophical through line that uh, is, in a sense, married to your uh, spiritual philosophical ideology? In, term, in, 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 a, in a sense, what you're talking about, is this what Rasta is about? Yeah. Rasta is, a, is an I and I philosophy. I, the physical and I, the spiritual is one. In the most basic explanation of Rastafari, that's what it is. I am Christ, and Christ is I. I see Christ in you, and I see Christ in everybody else. So if I move along with that philosophy, why should I want to harm Christ? Mm. You know, and that is Rastafari. That is what I was taught by my brother in PLA, and that is what I live by. Mm. You know. Forget about what this man do in his bedroom or this person does with their lover. This is unimportant. I see Christ in you, so I don't see wrong, period. Who you have to deal with on judgment day is your business. Mm. You know? I am not going to point a finger because who am I to judge? Mm. So, yeah, it's an I and I philosophy where I see Christ in everybody, and that is it for me. Mm. That's how I live my life. Do you find that because. Um because uh, the ideology that you practice is so close to the music, and music is going to everybody, do you find that there are people who can, in one way, completely understand what you are saying, whether they are Rasta or not? And then on the other side, 
people who can miss the whole points, whether they are Rasta or not? But everybody's Rasta. Mm. You see, because contrary to popular belief, we're born in righteousness, not in sin. See, they taught you that you're born in sin. You have to go sit in a church and pray to some, I don't know what, to become righteous. No, you're born in righteousness. God cannot make sin. God makes righteousness. So we're born in righteousness. You understand? And that is our move. So righteousness is Rasta. Everybody is Rasta. Mm. Simple. So you must understand because it's righteousness. We're tapping into sometimes it's a little difficult to get through, but a continual drop of water will bore a hole in a stone. Yeah. Mm. So we'll get through. And people are like tankers. They take a while to turn, but they will turn. Mm. So the message is Rasta, period. Mm. And everybody is. Everybody just have to tap into themselves to realize that they are. Because mm. everybody is righteous. Mm. So, yeah. On that note, let's hear another tune. This is reggae music. Welcome to the show.
Taz, um, I think I mispronounced your last name earlier. No, man, you pronounced it right. Wicks? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk a bit about your work with UNICEF and your role as a goodwill ambassador to St. Lucia? Is that correct? Yeah, the UNICEF ambassador, not goodwill. Okay, yeah. UNICEF ambassador. Um, about two years ago, I became UNICEF ambassador to St. Lucia. I'm actually a champion for children. Mm. Uh, UNICEF called, to, we're in what, 2015? Yeah. UNICEF called in 2012, I think. Mm. Because they had seen the work we had done previously with my own charity called the Orphan Cry Outreach. The Orphan Cry Outreach? The Orphan Cry Outreach. The Orphan Cry Outreach. Yeah, um, the name came about because we wrote a song on the D.I. Dem album called The Orphan's Cry. Mm. And a, a woman who worked at um, the UN called me up and asked me if I'd be willing to be the goodwill ambassador to the Caribbean mm. to shine our little spotlight on the Caribbean. Because usually, when people think about the Caribbean, they think of all-inclusive hotels, rum and coconut water, mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so on. Yeah. And don't realize that all the dollars that leave the Caribbean go to some big bank account in Switzerland. Mm. And, you know, the people them suffer. So we did what we did was we, we, we for a while I was the goodwill ambassador to the Caribbean. And I tried to shine my little spotlight with it. And every time I got a chance, I would talk about what ails us, our mm. maladies and our ills in the Caribbean. Mm. And we went to Trinidad and we gave away soccer balls and brought communities together. We helped out with um, microfinancing in Haiti, right on the border of the Dominican Republic. Mm. Um, we helped out in Dominica, St. Vincent. And since charity begins at home, we did most of our work in St. Lucia. Mm. Uh, UNICEF got a hold of what it is that we were doing mm. and asked me if I'd be willing to be the champion for children. Ah. So, we this, don't know so what, all this was already going on with your organization? Yeah, before UNICEF came on board. Oh. And the wonderful thing about UNICEF is it's kind of like a, a green light for some people. Because before, who didn't want to support Taj Weeks with his little charity came on board because I was UNICEF champion for children. Mm. So, you know, having a UNICEF stamp next to my name really, really helps out. So now we can do what we do um, in a grandiose way, right. you know? So, so, yeah, man, so what we do um, is we have an annual holiday party where we give away bikes to the kids, mm. three, 400 bikes. We just show up in our community and give bikes away. Mm. We give soccer balls away, show up on a field and throw 500 soccer balls on a field. Mm. You know, but I'll tell you what, I, I don't know if we might change anybody, but I know it has changed me. Mm. At the end of the day, you don't really truly know if there's any impact, mm. you know, because need is great. But it has changed me in a way that I cannot articulate. Mm. And that is the reward for me, mm. you know. So yeah, you know, we try to do, we actually in St. Lucia have the highest rate of diabetes per capita in the world. Really? Yeah, because we've adopted a North American and European lifestyle that we cannot sustain. Wow. We have five amputations per week, hey. you know, in a population of 173,000 people. Whoa. And if we continue at that rate, there'll be nobody left mm. to walk about. We have some people who come in and give wheelchairs, but if you see, it says, Hilia Senouches, mm. if you give a man a wheelchair, you're asking for danger. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're going to roll worse. along the mountain and you're going to crash. But then you have how many amputees rolled down the hill to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, we're also, we're trying, we're trying. Need is great, but we're trying. Well, what is the, the is, is the economy in St. Lucia any different than uh, most of the Caribbean? I mean, how, how is it, it? it is the same for the most part, but we've been doing very well. We, our rate of exchange, U.S. dollars, 265. Okay as opposed to 80 for one and, yeah. you know, a friend of mine told me she went to Guyana. Guyana, I'm not saying anything about her too. But she went to Guyana and she took a cab from the um, airport. And when she got to ours, the man tell us $8,000. So she didn't have $8,000. So he said, she turned and she said, how much? He said, 10 US. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> <laughs> But I might be a little off on the numbers, but it's kind of like that. Mm. But we've been doing all right. But what I keep saying is that we've been choking on fortunes fuel mm -hmm. because we get a couple of dollars and nobody walks anymore. Nobody cooks anymore. You know, once and two, people come in and 
to play another song, man, because we'll get in trouble when we start talking and things. <laughs> um, what we're playing? We'll play a song called Peace mm. and Love. Mm. You know, Taj, there's a lot of people talking about what Brooklyn was like at this point or that point. I mean, where we are now used to be farmland at some point a long time ago. But since you've been here, how have you found this dynamic mashup of so many different, um, well, people from all over the Caribbean? I mean, uh, north of South America, right up to the edge of. Miami. How has it been for you? 
Uh, well, I'll tell you what. What I keep saying is we should all mix up and really mess up the racist people. <laughs> you know? I think if we mix up enough, then they have no choice. They have to love somebody. Mm. You know? Because we're more, we're more alike than we're different, though. Mm. You know? They tell us what it is that we should think and how we should see things and how we should view the world. And all it has done is create a division. Mm. So if I mix with these people and then they will mix with that people, and what they're going to do, they can't really hate everybody. Mm. At some point, they too will be mixed up. Mm. So then we will have to have no choice but to love one another. Mm. Simple. How it was is how it was. We have to look at how it will be. Mm. You know? I mean, we have some brothers who say global warming is not happening. We have some brothers who are they liquidating of the earth. They say what's not happening? Global warming is not yeah. happening and all kinds of things. But mm. I just think, you know, at the end of the day, all of this is about money. Mm. But we need to have a different plan. We need to not listen to what they say and do whatever we want to do. Because inherently, we're good people, you know. It's them guys who give us the news who make us bad people, tell us how we should see other people, and how you should hold your puss in the elevator, or you should hide. No, we don't have to do this. If we never watched the news, we would all love each other. Mm. It's true. Because if you put two little children together, no matter where they came from, and you didn't influence them, they would grow up to love one another. It's when they go home and the mother say, well, this guy is not in our class, or this guy don't look like us. Mm. Stupidness, man. Mm. But I hope one day everybody will realize the Rasta in them, mm. and will love everybody and quash all this nonsense. So yeah, let me play some music. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> but play your tune called Sunny Innocence. Mm. And I'm gonna play you Sunny Innocence because it's in the Caribbean and it's everywhere else in the world that growing ups are taking advantage of children. You know, I told somebody I never saw a dog trying to have sex with a pup. So why are adults trying to have sex with children? Mm. You know? Mm. So this is about the Caribbean. Sunny innocence are lost to the woods. Mm. Sunny innocence, the guardians are no good. Mm. Sunny innocence, I pray the souls to keep. Sunny innocence, the wolves can't guard the sheep. Mm. Yeah. Mm.
Yeah, so um, we're, we're reaching that time real quick, man. Um, you guys got gigs coming up? Uh, boy, you have to check somebody else. I don't remember them things. I, okay, well, <laughs> I did hear about a Joe's Pub uh, thing. Yeah, 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 Joe's okay. Pub. Yeah. August. Oh, uh, yeah, August, and then we're in Calgary. Um, Calgary, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but Joe's Pub, yeah. Okay. I, can, I don't remember them things. All right, all right. I think Joe's I got Pub, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Joe's Pub, yeah. August. August 21st. Right. August 21st? Yes. All right, cool. It's really been great to, um, to talk with you. It's been great rocking with you guys. Yeah, this is Taj Weeks and Adoa, and I hope you're feeling as nice and airy as I am right now. Taj Weeks and his bombastic band brought the island energy to B-side, and I, I, for one, yeah. feel like I've just returned from an awesome staycation right here in BK. Yeah. So, uh, to check out past episodes of B-side, visit brickartsmedia.org slash B-side, and connect with us yeah, on Twitter, right. Instagram, and Screen YouTube out. at B Side BK. I'm your host, Satin Gauja, and if you want to check out the FON Sound System, every third Saturday we'll be in Dumbo under the arch of the Manhattan Bridge. We'll be there this Saturday as well. This is Satin Gauja signing off, and we're going to get some more tunes. Peace and love, Brooklyn.
Thank you.